Right, good afternoon, everybody. In times like these, certainty matters. Today I'm going to provide New Zealanders with certainty on who Labour will and won't work with after polling day. Kiwis deserve to know who they're voting for, what their bottom lines are, and what kind of government they could get after the election. First, I want people to vote for Labour. That will give New Zealand the core to strong, stable, progressive government. Oops. We are at our best when we are united. Division isn't a path to progress, and it's just not how I want to operate. Therefore, my message is simple. In this campaign, I will promote a message of unity, and I intend to work with parties and leaders who intend to do the same. That doesn't mean I won't criticise my opponents. In fact, I must. Elections are a contest of policies and values. Disagreements are a fundamental part of a healthy democracy. But in doing so, I will not be seeking to divide New Zealand communities. Labour's focus in this election won't be on imported culture wars, but fighting an economic war against inflation and inequality. As political leaders, we have choices. To play into fear, or to be optimistic and seek solutions that benefit us all. I think the biggest issues that we face as a country are around our economy, the cost of living, good jobs, good housing, reducing poverty and addressing climate change. And that's where our focus should be. National Act and New Zealand First, however, are focused on dividing New Zealand. They are a coalition of cuts and chaos that would not be able to get stuff done. They want to single some of us out, tell us that we're not as worthy as others, not as valued as others, not as Kiwi as others. We know where this leads. I just won't accept that. It goes against my values, Labour's values, and the values that define our country. I have news for all those who try to divide us and take us backwards. You will ultimately fail. Because Kiwis have always regarded unity as more important than division. I mean, you touched on on, on part of this on the part of this question in, in your in your answer, but I just uh, um, ask it anyway. And it was around the kind of the anxiety, because um, you you mentioned earlier that um, um, hate speech and its connection with people's sense of loss and loss of identity, or the or the perceived uh, sense of loss, and 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 how um, one can manage that process in terms of reducing that sense of um, loss uh, of whatever it might be. But it's recommendation 14 for which we are here today. To establish a programme to fund independent New Zealand specific research on the causes of and measures to prevent violent extremism and terrorism. But we've taken that recommendation a bit further. We wanted a permanent presence a repository of sorts to ensure the work is embedded in our thinking, our conversation and our policy making. And today we launch a National Centre of Research Excellence for Preventing and Countering Violent Extremism, Hefenua Tarikura. And so to the people I want to acknowledge today, the two directors of the centre, for which I can formally announce and which I'm sure is well known to those in the room particularly the two directors. If this is a surprise, we have a problem. <laughs> Professors Joanna Kidman and Paul Spoonley. Because Māori, for example, quite rightly would argue that they've taken them an awfully long time to get to a place probably where they're not yet where they, they feel they should be. I mean, is, is, there a, is there a new dynamic there that we have to worry about, Paul? Well, there is. And I mean, um, in terms of Auckland, it's already happened. So the Asian community is now considerably larger than the Māori community of Auckland, and yet Auckland is the largest Māori right. community in the country. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I think Auckland is the test case or the laboratory in which we get to play, and play is probably the wrong word because it's much more <laughs> serious than that, but we, in which we get to play around and, and decide how we do politics, and in this case, recognition of diversity. And we started today by talking about uh, council and the wards. Yeah. And, you know, we're far from getting that right. So we, we, we need to ask the question right around the community. Are there differences between people who are tangata whenua in terms of recognition 
as opposed to those who are immigrants and their descendants? And my answer is yes. Absolutely. I mean, I think the conversation should be a very different conversation. And so I react quite strongly and very negatively when people say, you know, there's, there's me, I'm Pakia, and there's others who are, who are different. No, there are not. They're not all the same. And we need to recognise and nuance those sorts of conversations. Yeah. I mm. feel like with that kind of uh, positioning of Pākehā versus everyone else, I always try to think of the ideal as being Māori and everyone else, because Māori, are, they're kind of the only unique kind of aspect of New Zealand that really needs to be upheld um, if we are to move forward. And I think there just needs to be more solidarity. The role of audiovisual media, and specifically television documentary, in transmitting cultural memory is significant as it enables the flow of memory through channels or forms such as visual, oral and oral traditions and can bring about new perspectives and critical reflections upon colonial discourse and dominant concepts of nation and culture. In addition to these social and intellectual processes of audience engagement, this thesis argues that experiential, effective dimensions of cultural memory can, in these specific circumstances, open up radical spaces, offering the potential for generating awareness and sparking political action. The New Zealand Wars documentary series, Discursive Struggle and Cultural Memory, a thesis submitted in fulfilment of the requirement of degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Screen and Media Studies at the University of Waikato by Lisa Perot. Murray Youth 5. It was quite emotional for me and I'm quite angry about it. Murray Youth 3. I was crying, man. Murray Youth 1. I just fa feel like getting the British flag and burning it. Murray Youth 3. Yeah, same here. I was blown away. I was crying and everything. I just honestly didn't think that everything was like that. But it was. Just how, like, the great chiefs, how they were just killed off like, like nothing. Extract from Maori Youth Focus Group Transcript. And thus New Zealand grew up. The increasing overseas markets expanded her production and the characteristics of her rural life were shaped. New Zealand's external purchases depend almost entirely on what comes from the land. Her social schemes, which are a feature of her national characteristic, depend largely on the same source. New Zealand has developed secondary industries and is self-dependent in many aspects. But the produce from the land is the mainstay of her existence, her overseas purchasing power. To take care of the land is to take care of the future. New Zealand exists in the soil. Today, taking care of the land has become a matter of national concern. Soil erosion has become a problem in some parts of New Zealand. In the early haste to clear more land for farming, fire was run through the forests of the plains and the valleys and was allowed to sweep bare the hill ranges also. Now nature is striking back at us for our past wastefulness. She is compelling us to reforest and to find other means of preventing denuded hillsides from slipping down and ruining fertile valleys. Nature never accepts excuses for mistakes, but we would have been more than human to have made no mistakes during the stupendous task of rushing forward a country from savagery to civilization in 100 crowded years. We have built and equipped modern cities where before there was nothing save perhaps a few huts of leaves and rushes. With large and fast ships, we have spanned the oceans which separate us from our neighbors, and we have provided the best of port equipment for our commerce. We have spread a trackless land with a network of roads, and over them 
we operate the transport of a nation. We have bonded the country with rails of steel for our steam and electric trains. And we build the trains, which ply like shuttles from end to end of our land. We have bridged the rivers and gorges which blocked our path. We have harnessed the rivers to provide light and heat and power for our transport, our cities and our industries. With airports and aircraft, we have brought 20th century speed to a Stone Age land, telescoping centuries together in a few short years. this and more we have done in our first hundred years, building on the foundations laid for us by the sweat and the toil of our pioneers. All these material things we have formed, but what of the human side? What have we done for our people? We have done much. New Zealand has always paid high regard to the welfare of the people, their health, their homes, their education, their occupations, and their freedom. Let us look at random at a few of the monuments which testify to this national concern for human well-being. Public health, a state department, always watching over the things affecting the health of the people and ensuring that they have hygienic living conditions. At the state school, the children's health is watched over while they are receiving their education. Pure milk is issued to the children every day and staffs of doctors and nurses give regular medical and dental care. All such work must first receive the consent of parents and it is done with the cooperation of, of education authorities. It is free of charge, as is education itself. With ability and inclination, primary school pupils can win further free education at colleges and at universities. But with all the skill and care bestowed, people still fall sick and when illness overtakes the family breadwinner, Family finances are apt to be badly strained. So we have our national social security scheme, giving free general and maternity hospital care and universal old age payments. Now run back down the scale from old age to infancy. Here New Zealand leads the world. The late Sir Truby King pioneered and developed a New Zealand system of infant welfare, which has now become a worldwide movement. New Zealand today has the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. And all over the world are these living memorials to the life work of a great man. All these things revolve about the home, the New Zealanders' chief concern. Of course, home means more than just a house. But a house is one of the main parts of a home. The State Housing Department is carrying out a big national plan building houses which are not workers' dwellings, but homes for people who work. The problem is how to build enough to meet the demand. Another of New Zealand's problems has special reference to our Maori people, how best they can adapt themselves to the changed ways of life brought by the Europeans. It is a problem which both our races are uniting to solve by mutual effort, by goodwill, and by cooperation. The impact of Western civilization a hundred years ago caused a drastic and imperative adjustment in the economic life of the Maori people and in consequence a transitional period had to be endured. My forebears discarded some of their tribal customs. In this period, differences and disputes arose. Happily, those days are past, and our two races now live together in harmony. Indeed, the Maori Battalion of Volunteers is now in England, side by side with the Pākehā New Zealand soldiers, as in the Great War, to defend the land and the rights we share.
However, in some matters, we must retain our individuality, our carving and weaving, our music and dancing. These are an expression of something deep within us. But music and dancing and art are not enough for this modern world. We need also such things as our native land development scheme and the adaptation of modern farming to the community instincts of the Maori. There is a reawakening among the Maori people and a realization of the need to meet the Pākehā at his own game. I should like you to know of our native schools and colleges, for education is the beginning of understanding with both Māori and Pākehā, an understanding that must weld our future. But what is to be our future? Sadly, our first century closes with conflict ravaging the world, conflict on a vast scale, Conflict which we rise to face in 1940 with the same spirit in which we faced it in 1914. To secure the future, we must first look to the present, taking courage from the past. Will we of this generation lay as good a foundation for New Zealand's second century as our pioneers did for the first? They knew hard necessity and harsh abandonment of kinsfolk who were dear. They knew fears, and with hope they laid aside their fears and struggled on through a thousand trials and vicissitudes. Their very purpose breathes a challenge which we, in the knowledge of their deeds, carry on into a new century to face a new and striving future with the undaunted spirit that was theirs to leave to our children that precept which our pioneers have left to us. May God grant that we shall not fail them. Yes. Can I, I, I want to, I, th I think it's a really important question and I want to address it in a very specific way and that is that I'm Pākehā. So, you know, we've had our hegemony for a very long time. Um, it feels very uncomfortable to be challenged in, 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 in certain ways and to feel that somehow we are not going to main, be able to maintain our hegemony. Uh, sorry, perhaps this is a better word, but our hegemony. So how is it that we have a, a discussion in which we can talk to Pākehā, with Pākehā, about how being Pākehā, what that means in a 21st century New Zealand in which tativity plays a, a more fundamental role. I, I'm an optimist. I would like to think that we can have that discussion by saying these are the things that you can gain. Um, you're not losing anything, you're gaining something. Now that might be very Pollyannish, but it's, it's, it's how you frame it. And I think we've got some wonderful people. I mean, Moana Jackson has been a, um, one of the speakers on, in the series. And, you know, having heard Moana on, on many occasions, I think that he and others are able to discuss very difficult issues in ways that are not undermining, um, which are affirming, even to Pākehā who need to change and might need to give up some of the things that they feel very hold, um, some of the things they hold very important. So I think one of the key challenges for us in this area is to say what is going to be the language, who's going to articulate it, and how do we have that discussion in a way that engages Pākehā, doesn't 
push them out to the boundaries or push them away from the discussion. And I, I, I think that's one of the most profound things that we could do in a Tiriti-based future discussion.